And now your host this evening, John Henry. Welcome everybody to both sides of the conversation for our educational Thursdays. This is our first educational Thursday presentation after the New Year's. So happy New Year's. Welcome everybody back to business. I know everybody's getting going. There's a lot of things going on out there and everybody's getting back to a, a halfway space of normality. And um, just wanna welcome everybody back and thank you uh, for joining us tonight. We're gonna have a, another uh, presentation that should be phenomenal for the community. You guys know these educational Thursday presentations are about being intentional to educate our community on different topics, on different uh, things that we need to know because we understand the gap of information is sometimes what's holding us back in our own communities and um, getting this information to lace our boots and uh, to make us more competitive and, and, and have tools that we can use to be better successful. And that's what these Educational Thursday presentations are about. So I am the co-founder, John Henry, of both sides of the conversation. We have a phenomenal guest tonight. Um, before we get started, just wanna say a couple of things. I know right now, um, the events that's taking place in our country is affecting a lot of people. And um, you know, it's just a shame at this day and age and this time to see what we are seeing is unbelievable. But I think the reverse side of it is the world and people seeing what black and brown community has talked about white privilege in America and some of the some of the issues that we've complained about how the treatment of people are very different when it comes to black and brown people versus our white counterparts. And I think this is a, a touching moment. And I think it's also an opportunity uh, to unite. And I know several people lost their lives in that situation. And even if we don't agree with the message or the movement that they are part of, anytime we lose someone is sad because it shouldn't have to take a life of loss um, to deal with these different issues. We have to learn to communicate, commune to heal, can continue to work together. And I think that's what we're trying to provide here um, at both sides of the conversation so we don't have to go to these extremes. Let's talk about it. Let's get it off our chest and let's work together. So with that being said, I'm gonna lead that alone. It's a touchy situation for a lot of people, but my people stay together, stay united, understand where we stand and let's do better this new year of educating, continue to unite, work together and help build each other up. I think that's that should be our goal uh, moving forward as, as community. So, um, you know, just wanted to get that out there. And then one other thing, um, I know the information has been uh, going around uh, one of the alleged suspects who may have had something to do with the young kid, the six-year-old kid who was killed on July 4th, Chase Young. Um, one of the suspect alleged was arrested. So, um, you know, hope that family uh, can get a little bit of some understanding and some calmness. And then, you know, also to the young man who was taken in custody, you know, prayers out to his family as well. And um, I know it's a tough situation um, for all parties involved. And, um, you know, we still have to have compassion and humility. Um, sometimes people do things and make bad decisions and the attention may not be there. But then again, when we lose a six year old, it's, it's touching for our community and we just got to keep those families in the prayers and, um, you know, it's, it's a tough one for me. I work with the young people, so I know I know closely and um, it's, it's very disturbing and it's hurting, um, but we got to continue to move together. We got to work with our young people, educate them and teach them how to deal with conflict resolution, conflict management. And we have to start getting our young people to understand how to deal with uh, situations other than using firearms. Uh, so just prayer to those families and prayers to all the families out there. Prayers for everybody. We need prayer, we need healing. And, uh, you know, hopefully with communication, we can continue that process and uh, we just need it. And with this COVID out there, please be safe. I mean, I know you guys are seeing the nose. It's not going away. Even with these vaccinations, the cases are going up. People are being affected. So stay safe out there. Continue to safe distance, wear your mask, be safe out there. And, uh, you know, just think about yourself and take it serious because it is real. And it's very important that we... Uh, continue to respect each other's space in this time. So um, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to our tonight's guest, our phenomenal guest. She's so epic, I love her. She has so much energy and passion. I know she's about community because that's why she's here. You know, these presentations are people who volunteer, you know, here at both sides of the conversation. We always complain 
and, and have things to say about people who clam the corporate letter or clam the educational letter and they forget to reach back and help the people below. And this sister here is a, definitely a demonstration of what that looks like. No matter how far I excel, I still wanna see my people doing good. And uh, we appreciate her for that. She was our hidden gem a couple of months ago. She also was a led, led, led our Sunday conversation on a very impactful, passionate conversation. And uh, I just love her spirit and I'm glad that she's back tonight. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to our educational pre presenter tonight, Natasha B. Y'all know who she is, she back again. She gonna let y'all know. So uh, with that being said, thank you Natasha for coming on. We appreciate you supporting us and uh, doing the things that you do for our community and making sure that we all have the information and tools and just wanna thank you before we start. Thank you. Um, excited to be here as always. This is always a good space. So thank you for hosting it, holding it down, and um, all the work you all do behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, especially now, right, in this COVID world, like this is how we're getting information. So it's more critical that we have these spaces now more than ever. Um, so I've been on this show before, as he said, or not this show, but I've been on both sides of the conversations. And some of you all know me from the Slave Rebellion event that we held um, a couple months ago. And, you know, just got to highlight the, the, that this month, January, um, kind of just leading off of those Slave Rebellion conversations um, is also the month that we celebrate the Haitian Revolution. And yesterday was the celebration of the Maroons defeating the British in Jamaica. Um, that was a huge ceremony. So if you have some time, Google that, because it, it was this was the first time they actually had it online virtually. And it was just dope to be able to witness. So that's my plug for that. Um, tonight, I am here to talk about taxes, right? How we go from slave rebellion to taxes. Um, I don't know, but that's what we're doing. So um, in addition to doing just kind of community education work, I am also a tax professional. I went to law school and after law school, I got my advanced law degree in taxes. And one of my passions is um, to make sure that we understand the basics of taxation because our community, people in general, right? Like taxes is a foreign language. It's really taboo. Nobody knows nothing about it. People know it in piecemeal. Um, they think they have really good tax advice. And it's like, that's really good advice for somebody else's situation, not necessarily yours. And so um, one of my kind of personal missions, especially as I know as Black people, as we're becoming more entrepreneurial, is to understand taxes because your businesses and your personal finances are not going to thrive if you don't understand the basis of taxation. Um, specifically, what I see a lot of is a lot of us rely on CPAs and different tax preparers and people to um, be educated on our behalf. And as somebody who's on the other side, what I see is a lot of people who are kind of like, ah, this should work. Um, you know, and people are doing their due diligence, but there's a disconnect. So a lot of times as the tax filing person, if you end up owing, you don't know why you owe. You don't know what your tax preparer did. You don't even know how to have a conversation with your tax planner because you kind of just left it up to them to figure out how to meet your needs. And um, that's a very vulnerable space to be in. And so one of my missions, as I said, is to make sure that our community has a basic understanding of taxation. So that way, when you begin working with tax preparers, or tax professionals, you can engage in a conversation. You can advocate for the deductions, the credits, um, your tax planning strategy, as opposed to completely being vulnerable and leaving that up to other people to do on your behalf. Um, so tonight's conversation, I'm going to kind of just go through some basic slides on the 1040. And I know that's really basic. Some of you are like, the 1040, I already know about that. Um, but I know a lot of you don't, right? Like a lot of us are going on H&R Block or we're going to somebody else, we're giving them our forms. And, you know, if we get a refund, we're like, yeah. And if we're overpaying, we're like, I think I overpay, but I'm not sure how, but we really don't have a way to look at that. And so um, tonight, like I said, I'm going to go through the 1040. And then starting next week, I'm actually launching some tax classes for $30 a piece. I'll be launching them for the next four Thursdays. And they will cover things in terms of like taxation of entities, um, the Schedule C, if you're a sole proprietor, if you have an LLC, um, uh, you know, you're 
sorry, you're a solo practitioner or solo with the LLC. Um, I'll also be talking about deductions, making sure you understand the four types of deductions. There's the standard deduction, itemized deduction, business deductions, and above the line deductions, and kind of getting an understanding of how to plan around those basic deductions. And then the last one is going to be settling with the IRS. So if you do owe the IRS, um, what are the avenues that you have to petition and say, I don't owe, I don't want to pay, or what are your avenues to be like, I do owe, how do I pay or I do owe and I absolutely cannot pay um, how do you get in compliance in each of those three situations so that's what the next four Thursdays are going to be about um, so yeah if you want to sign up for those tax classes you can email me or you can go to my website um, vinscolaw.com or you can check me out on so social media I'm at on Instagram at Tasha Talks Tax and I also have a Facebook page which um, the law office of Natalia A. Bensko and all those places you can find information about tax class. All right, moving on. Um, I am going to share my screen so we can get into these slides. Can you all see my screen? Just if Asia yep, you up. Yep, okay. yep, you up. Cool. So um, what I have are my tax commandments. Um, you know, I like to make these things um, fun as much as you can make tax fun um, or at least let it resonate. And so my first commandment is thou shall not fear the 1040. A lot of us do not look at tax documents. Like we're just scared to look at them and they are confusing. And so um, today I, my hope is to demystify this process and in my following workshops I'll continue to demystify that work um, to demystify these forms for you so goals for today familiarize yourself with the 1040 and how it works and learning some basic tax language because you know people will be like is this a write-off is this a um, you know, is this a deduction? And we use all this interchangeable language. And every time people use this language, I kind of laugh inside because I'm like, do you know what that even means? Or did you just hear somebody else say it? And so um, today I'm going to make sure you all know the language. So starting with the basics. Um, so we all know the 1040 is basically the form that we use to file taxes or some version of it. And this is what we call a tax return. So um, there are different kinds of tax returns. The 1040 is what you use to um, let, let the IRS know what your personal income and your personal deductions are for the year. That is the form that we all file, you know, the April 15th deadline. Um, another term used for returns is also your W-2s, your 1099s. So a lot of different things are called returns. And so if you're working with a tax preparer and they ask for your returns, what they're doing is they're asking for any stubs that you may have gotten for the year that prove your income. And so, we have the tax return that we file, and then we have the returns that we get that people who pay us um, give us as proof of income. Now, the next thing is, what is income, right? A lot of us think that's basic, like the money I make. Yes, but the default rule in addition to that is every dollar you make is taxable. So even illegal money, right? Like that's how the IRS gets a lot of people is because they don't report their illegal income and then they get them for tax evasion when they can't get them for criminal behavior or, you know, like they can't get them under other criminal statutes. So sometimes people will get them for tax evasion. So you see that come up a lot of times in drug sales. Like, okay, I can't prove you sold drugs, but I can't prove you didn't pay taxes on your drug money. And so, um, yeah, so the, I say that to use that as an example of that every dollar you make, whether you got a side hustle or whatever you do, the default rule, the general rule is that all money is subject to taxation. What we're used to understanding as income that's subject to taxation is whether we get a W-2s or 1099s. And so a lot of times people are like, well, I didn't get a 1099 or a W-2, so that money is not subject to taxes, right? Wrong, because what did I say the default rule is? If you make money, it's subject to taxes, to taxation. So what's the what's what's the um, what's the exception to that? Because a lot of people are like, well, I know this money isn't subject to taxes, or this money isn't subject to taxes. So how are you telling me that everything is subject to taxes, but I know my social security or some other money that I get isn't subject to taxes? 
like I said, the default rule is everything is subject to taxes. Unless you are clear that there is a statute that governs that your money is not subject to taxes, it is. And I emphasize that because once again, I hear people say all the time that, well, I was told I didn't have to pay taxes. And in my mind, you know, as a tax professional, I'm like, what part of the Internal Revenue Code told you that you didn't have to pay taxes? And when I ask people that they can't answer it. And so I'm like, if the Internal Revenue Code didn't tell you you didn't have to pay taxes, you should assume. But to help clarify, there are statutes in the Internal Revenue Code that make it clear what type of income is not subject to taxation. So all is not lost. Um, I have some examples here um, and we call that money exceptions to gross income. And so like I said, the default rule, and I'm gonna keep repeating myself because I like things to stick in people's brains, is that all money is subject to taxation unless it kind of falls under this exceptions to gross income rule. And so um, some examples of exceptions to gross income are certain social security. Social security is like a whole matrix, but a lot of times people will find themselves in a situation where their social security is exempt from taxation. Um, certain settlements. So if you're getting settlements for um, personal physical injuries. So if somebody, you know, you sued somebody for a tort because they broke your jaw and they compensated you for breaking your jaw. Um, the money that's for that personal physical injury um, is not subject to taxation um, or discrimination suits. There's examples there um, where that money is not subject to taxation. So there's those, those are certain kind of settlements, but in general, most settlements actually are subject to taxation. And I pause there because that's like a misnomer where people are kind of like, well, I was told that my settlement wasn't subject to taxation. And what probably really happened there is that your settlement might be a deductible expense if you itemize your deductions. And we're going to go into the different kind of itemized um, deductions in a second, but that doesn't mean that your your income isn't set, that money isn't subject to income. What it means is there might be another rule down the road that might reduce the taxation. But in general, settlements um, are pretty much, the general rule is that settlements are subject to taxation unless they're for personal physical injury or certain types of discrimination. Um, and then the other one is loan forgiveness. And so, um, there's certain kind of loan forgivenesses that are exceptions to gross income, but note there's certain kind of loan forgivenesses that are considered income. And so loan forgiveness is kind of like a double-edged sword because I've seen people come and they're like, all of a sudden somebody filed a 1099 saying I got an extra $10,000 and we look into it and it's like, oh, because they forgave your loan. And people are like, they forgave that loan in 2010 but they filed the loan forgiveness in 2019. And so you really wanna be clear that um, when you're in those situations where you're like, oh, they took my car back, thank you Jesus, cause I couldn't afford it. Um, and they just forgave my loan, I'm good. You really wanna go back and look through those papers cause that information might later come back at you as taxable income for the amount that was forgiven. And so um, these are just a few of the exceptions. Um, to gross income. And like I said, there's a lot of caveats to them. And so, like I tell people, you want to be clear when you're not reporting money as income, why you're not reporting it. And you want to make sure that it's rooted in the tax code and not um, just some haphazard advice that may have applied to somebody else's situation, but is not applicable to yours. So that that's my basics. Um, yeah, let me see what this last line here says. Yeah, so generally when we're talking about taxation, the first step is to figure out all the money that you have coming in, right? The step money is like, let me count all the hair that I did, all the money I got from my W-2 job, all my side hustles, all my Lyft driving. Let me make sure I'm clear about all the money I had coming in. And then after you go through that, you get that list of all the money you made, then you go through the code or you talk to a tax professional, right? And you're like, okay, where is, um, what of this income may be an exception to gross income so I don't have to report it as taxation. And that's where we come in and we go through all the income you made and we say, you don't have to report this, you don't have to report this, you do have to report that. And that's how we know how much actually gross income you have to figure out what you're gonna end up paying taxes on. So that's step one. Um, step two, 
is now that we know what your gross income is, we have to figure out what your deductions are. So let's say we went through all your income and we decided you had $100,000 worth of gross income. That whole $100,000 is not going to be taxable because the next step is to go through your deductions. And with deductions, your goal is to be like, if I start out with $100,000 of gross income, how do I get that number down as low as possible? So getting it down can be through deductions. And the more you get that number down, the more you have a chance of getting to a lower tax bracket, right? Because people who are making $100,000 are not gonna be taxed the same as people who are making $50,000. So there's, there's incentives there for reducing your, um, for finding deductions, getting you to a lower tax bracket, which will in turn minimize the amount of taxes that you're paying. And so when I talk about deductions, um, what am I talking about, right? Interchangeably known as write-offs. And, um, you know, some people say they, they will describe income as not taxable when it's really a deduction. And so that um, that's a kind of mistaken way to describe a deduction, but it happens often. And so I kind of want to go through... Um, the main kind of deductions that I think everybody should be familiar with. And the reason why I'm going through these is because a lot of times people will tell you that something's a deduction, but they won't tell you what type of deduction. And just because it's a deduction doesn't mean you get to take it. One, you have to verify that something's a deduction. And then two, you have to figure out, are you eligible to take that deduction? So let's go through our deductions here. Um, the first one is a standard deduction. This is the deduction that everyone is entitled to. It's a flat amount. Um, it's based on your status. And so what I mean by status is if you're filing as single, married, or head of household. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I know for like single people who don't have kids, it's like a $12,000 plus some change deduction. Um, if you're head of household, I believe it's $18,000 and some change. If you're married filing jointly, it's $24,000 some change. So that's what the standard deduction to it is. Everybody's entitled to it. That does not mean everybody's going to take it. And the reason why is because as tax filers, we all have to choose between taking our standard deduction and our itemized deduction. Itemized deductions are um, all the deductions that the Internal Revenue Code kind of allows you to take. And so what a good kind of tax preparer will do by the way, I'm not a tax preparer, y'all. I'm a tax lawyer and I do tax planning. I don't do preparation. I can refer you out there, but I don't do that because that's, that, that's not my thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm good enough doing tax law and tax planning. But um, ideally, what a tax planner or a tax preparer will do is they will go through the Internal Revenue Code, which is like two books this big. That's why, I'm, that's why you see my hands like that. And um, they kind of are familiar with that whole code and they know what deductions you're entitled to. And so what we do is we say okay yes you get the standard deduction but my goal is to see if i can get you more deductions so if you are a married filing jointly and you are therefore entitled to the twenty four thousand and some change of a standard deduction i'm trying to find you twenty five thousand dollars plus in deductions and then you have to pick between either taking the standard deduction the itemized deduction of course you're going to want to take the itemized deduction because it's more so itemized deductions. Itemized deductions are like your charitable giving, right? So if you're giving to tithes, um, tithing to your church, you're doing charities, things like that. Um, those are generally itemized deductions. I will say that there was an exception this year through the CARES Act where we were all able to take a $300 deduction um, for charitable giving. It was kind of I guess the CARES Act way, the government's way of saying we are trying to help nonprofits too. I don't know but there was an exception made for this year. Um, that's what I do know. But outside of that, generally it's an itemized deduction. Um, your property taxes. So, you know, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you can deduct, you know, amount, larger amounts of your property taxes. Um, we call them SALT taxes. Now it's capped at 10,000. Um, you may have deductions for different like investment vehicles. You might have deductions for um, mortgage interest for a house you buy. So an infamous question that people always come is like, should I buy a house? I hear it's going to help me in taxes. And I'm like, 
in my mind as a tax preparer, I'm thinking, you should buy a house if the deductions you're gonna get outweigh your standard deduction. But if you're buying the house in like November, the end of the tax year, because somebody told you it's a good way to cut down on taxes, your deductions might not outweigh your standard deduction because what you're accruing in mortgage interest and property taxes might not outweigh your standard deduction. Um, and so it's, it's always a balancing act. And so one year you might wanna take a standard deduction, the next year you might wanna itemize. And so this is important to know because this is a conversation that you do wanna have with your tax preparer every year. You wanna be able to bring those returns remember our language returns, those receipts that you have that say, these are all the deductions I'm entitled to. And do these deduction, itemized deductions outweigh my standard deduction? Um, the other thing, reason why I um, kind of harp on this for so long is because a lot of people have itemized deductions and it's still in their benefit to take the standard deduction. And so in short, they feel like they got played, right? So like if you get a settlement and it's not for a personal physical injury, so like let's say you get a $5,000 settlement, but it's included as income because it's not considered something, because it's considered something you have to itemize. It's taxable income, but you do get a deduction, but it's an itemized deduction. But as we know, 5,000 doesn't outweigh 12,000. Um, you might be in a situation where you're like, what? Like, so you basically tell me I have to pay taxes on my settlement. I was injured and I have to pay taxes. That doesn't seem fair, but that, that, that is the rule. You have to choose between the standard and the itemized. Um, on a lighter note, what's more interesting is what we call the above the line deductions um, or adjustments. So that's interchangeable language there. And um, those are deductions that everybody gets to take whether you take a standard deduction or itemized deduction. So some um, uh, adjustments that we might be familiar with are deductions for putting into your IRA. So if you have a retirement plan, um, you get, I think up to a $6,000 deduction, um, tuition, um, interest, that's a standard deduction. Um, there's a list of them and we're gonna look at them when I pull up the 1040, but it's kind of like a very narrow class of deductions, but they're deductions that people are entitled to whether you claim the standard or the itemized. And then what happens, right? So we started with our gross income of $100,000. Let's say we found $40,000 of itemized deductions and above the line adjustments, right? So we are saying we're not gonna take the standard deduction because between itemized deductions and above the line deductions, I have $40,000 worth of deductions. That's more than the standard deduction. Um, so now if I subtract my deductions from my income, I have $60,000 of income left. So you see how we got from that $100,000 tax bracket to that $60,000 tax bracket by accumulating deductions? That's what um, tax planning is. And so what we call that $60,000 is our adjusted gross income. So gross income is that $100,000 we made, that raw, everything's taxable. Adjusted gross income is the income we have. Um, oh, sorry, I, I misspoke that, sorry. Standard and itemized come later. I'm talking about taxable income. My bad, y'all. I'm getting ahead of myself. So we have that $100,000 of income, right? Back up. We have $100,000 of gross income. Then we have our above the line deductions or adjustments. Let's say we come up with $15,000 of above the line deductions and adjustments. Because you might have a lot, you might not have as much, right? Like a lot of your deductions are going to accumulate when you go to your itemized deductions more so than your above the line. So what happens is um, we had 100, but we found 15 and above the line deductions slash adjustments. So now we've moved our income from 100,000 to 85,000. And that's what we call adjusted gross income. And so I say that because a lot of times people will ask you, what's your, what is your AGI, right? Like when we talk about tax terminology, people are just throwing stuff around. What's your AGI? Um, and people are like, I don't know, like my income, my W-2 said I made this much. They're not asking what your W-2 said. They're asking what is your income after you take your above the line deductions. So a lot of times people are telling people my AGI is 100,000 when your AGI is really 85. And the reason why I harper on this is because a lot of institutions look at your AGI to determine your qualification for different benefits and things like that, right? So if you, um, are getting certain benefits or trying to qualify for programs. Um, 
sometimes you, it is in your best interest. If you're trying to look like you make more money, it's in your best interest to argue your in um, your gross income. If you're trying to look like you make less money because you're trying to qualify for benefits, you're trying to argue your AGI. And honestly, most of the time service providers, because I'm a social worker too. I know y'all, I got too many degrees. I got four, two in social work, two in law. But um, the, the, a lot of times the service providers and people who are asking you these questions, they don't know the difference between your gross income and your AGI. Like they're not really familiar with tax forms and the terminology. And so it is sometimes in your best interest to be like, well, my AGI is, you didn't ask what kind of income, you didn't specify if you want to know my gross income or my AGI. So I told you the income that was in my best interest. If you wanna know more, ask more specific questions. Um, so that, that's why that information is important to know. But um, yeah, that's my little plug on knowing the difference between AGI. So yeah, if you're looking for benefits and stuff like that, the idea is to talk about your AGI. So now we got your AGI, right? But your AGI is not your taxable income. Your AGI is just like I said, the number that a lot of institutions are looking for to determine if they either want to give you loans or benefits or whatever. Um, the income that decides what's taxable is your taxable income. The next line, line five. And so that's where we add our standard or itemized deductions to bring it down. So let's say what I just say, I said that we had we started with $100,000 in income. Then we moved on down to $15,000 of adjustments. So that got us to $85,000. And now let's say um, we found another 30, I'm gonna, what did I say? If the sand, okay, $30,000 in itemized deductions, right? Let's say we found another 30,000 because um, you know, we just, we, we was just getting all kind of deductible expenses that year, you know, whether it was a settlement or property taxes, we bought a house, whatever happened, we decided that we had $30,000 in itemized deductions. So now our income goes from 85 minus 30, $55,000. And the $55,000 is what's subject to tax. So that's what I was starting to explain later, but I was like, wait, wait, I got to talk about AGI. So do y'all see how that works? The idea is that we got our gross income. We use our adjustments to bring it down to get a lower AGI, which brought us down to 85. Then we use our standard or itemized deductions, whatever's higher. In our example, we said itemized because we found $30,000 worth of itemized deductions. And we brought our income down to $55,000. And that $55,000 is what's considered our taxable income. And you see how that brings you down to a lower tax bracket. So instead of being in a $100,000 tax bracket, you're now in a $55,000 tax bracket. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I'm just talking. Okay, so, oh, I got some, let me, let me take some water real quick, excuse me. Okay, so now we're at this $55,000 taxable income. We lowered our tax bracket. What else can we do to eliminate taxes? Right. So, look, at, Lala's here talking about right. <laughs> and so anyway, um, so $55,000 of taxable income, that's not our tax bill. What we would do is we would go to the tax table, we would look at $55,000, we would figure out how much we're paying in taxes. What do we owe? Um, I'm just gonna throw a number out there. Let's say it's, we made 55,000, let's say it's $7,000. We go to the tax table and we find out that whatever our tax bracket is, leaves us with a $7,000 tax bill on the $55,000 of taxable income that we made. Now we look to be like, okay, I got a $7,000 tax bill. How do I bring this down? That's when we look at credits. And what credits are here at line six is their dollar to, for dollar um, amounts that knock down our tax bill. So some of the credits that we're familiar with are childcare tax credits, there are certain credits for, um, owning homes, having businesses, right? There's a whole bunch of credits out there. Um, what you do is you look for credits and you say, I'm entitled to all these credits <clears throat> and those credits knock down your tax bill. So let's say you go through all the credits and you find that you're entitled to $5,000 worth of credits. Those $5,000 credits, dollar for dollar, knock down your $7,000 tax bill, which would leave you with a $2,000 tax bill. And that's generally how tax planning or, um, you know, tax filing works is you look for what all your gross income is, you look for your adjustments, 
then you look for your deductions and then you decide if you're gonna take the itemized deduction or the standard deduction. You figure out what your taxable income is and then you look for credits to knock down your taxable income. And that is how individuals reduce their um, tax, um, their tax liability. Businesses work very much the same. Businesses are also entitled to deductions and credits. And depending on the kind of business you have, you know, there's a whole bunch of different planning opportunities out there. And so people are always looking at businesses like, oh my gosh, how did these big corporations not pay any money? It's like, they didn't pay any money because they found a whole bunch of deductions and credits. That's how that happens. If you don't want these big businesses to, you know, get away with not paying any taxes, then we need to be lobbying around the deductions and the credits we allow them to take. But because most of us know nothing about taxes, we don't even know how to lobby for that. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Oh my, it's 6.37. Um, okay, I was gonna, I think y'all got that. Um, if you wanna learn more, like I said, you can come to tax class. At tax class, we would thoroughly go through the forms. Yes, you gotta go to tax class. Lala's here commenting. Um, yeah, so we can go through the forms more thoroughly so you can see what actually applies to you in terms of credit standard deductions and ask those kind of questions. Um, I had an old 1040 here. Um, I use the old 1040 because I think it's a better teaching tool. Basically, all the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did was, I mean, it did some stuff, but it broke this form up into like five different forms. And so I was going to use this form to kind of walk you through what I just described. In general, this is where we would report income. This is where we would report adjusted gross income. So this is where we would report um, kind of those adjustments that we talked about and figure out where your AGI is. Here, this is where we would figure out your tax, um, your, your tax, your tax table, sorry, your tax table and what's your taxable income. We would apply credits. Um, and then you would figure out right here if you have a refund or if you owe. And so the old form actually used to be very direct and clear and helping you break this down. The new form has, the new forms have broken this down into about like four or five different forms. And so it's really hard to piece together. So no, I'm not unprofessional. I'm just using an old tool because the old tool is an easier teaching tool. Okay, so some final notes. Um, Let's see, what do I have here? I say, um, when discussing what you can adjust, deduct, or get credits for, um, remember that the tax code is full of all kinds of deductions. It's like two books this thick, literally. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a lot of information and it's constantly changing. And so this is why it's important for you to understand the basics so you can have competent conversations, like I said, with the people who are preparing your taxes. Um, yeah, because you just don't want to trust people with your money like that. Like you don't trust nobody else with your money like that. So why would you trust your tax professionals? Um, honestly, like people be like, oh, my tax person's good. How do you know? Like really, how do you know? Because you ain't been audited yet? Like, do you know what they're doing? And so um, I like to empower people just to get their own education. Um, and the other thing is, I like to note the second note is that there has been a lot of changes in these past couple of years to the tax cut, between the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the CARES Act. So old information might be outdated. Like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act totally changed um, different aspects of tax law. The CARES Act came behind that and did that as well. And probably with this new administration, we're going to see even more changes. And so make sure the information that you're getting is current because information may have been true, but it's no longer true anymore. So that's information that you would want to know while doing your tax planning. Um, the next note is once you understand the deductions and the credits you're able to take, um, the idea is that you'll be able to better understand whether you should be taking a standard deduction, an itemized deduction. Um, other questions that people come to me is like, can I afford to start a business this year? And what that usually goes into conversations around losses. I can't tell you how often people are like, I can't start a business this year because I don't, I don't have enough money. But when I go through their tax forms, it's like, you totally do. You can totally afford to take losses with your business this year. And it would offset your W-2 income and actually give you a refund. Um, like I said, because people don't really understand the forms, they don't really understand what they can and cannot afford to do. People hear losses and they think it's a negative thing. Um, 
business losses are not a bad thing if you're simultaneously working and you're getting a w-2 income because what it does is they end up, it ends up netting your w-2 income so that you're making less so you're having less taxable income which usually means a refund for you and i know this because this is how i started my own business right experience is a great teacher um so th these are quite these are kind of more high level tax planning questions that you will probably start asking like i said a lot of us are like entrepreneurial we're tired of being in the system we all got side hustles um we want to start a side hustle we have started a side hustle we're not reporting our side hustle or formalizing our side hustle because we don't know anything about taxes or we're scared we can't afford to start a business um you might be surprised to find that you actually can, like starting a business will create losses that work in your favor. Um, and then when you get real fancy with it, um, here's my other note, you can start thinking about ways to lower your taxes on the long run. So we're not even just talking about accumulating deductions, but we're talking about actual business planning. Um, one of the things that people always come to me is they're like, I think I'm supposed to start an LLC because it's gonna help with taxes. And I'm like, no, like tell me more about that. Why do you think an LLC is going to help you with taxes? LLCs help with liabilities. You still need a separate tax planning strategy. Like the tax planning strategy that I'm going to use as a sole proprietor without an LLC, and if I had an LLC, would probably be the same unless I decided to um, have my LLC get elect corporate tax treatment. And then I have to go into whether I'm electing S corporate tax treatment or C corporate tax treatment. And that's a whole nother analysis. And so People tend to, like I said, they tend to get this piecemeal advice and be like, oh, no, I'm studying LLC because it's going to help with taxes. And I'm like, An LLC by yourself does not help you with taxes. You still have to have a strategy behind that. Um, but when you get real fancy, we can start talking about those strategies. And then, um, like I said, um, if you're really trying to learn this stuff, start with the basics. Start pulling up these forms, playing with the forms, get familiar with the 1040. Then once you get familiar with the 1040, and if you have a business, that's when we can start seeing how your corporate tax forms or your business tax forms impact your 1040. And I say that because um, your LLCs that don't elect corp, what your LLCs, your S corps, and your sole proprietors those forms all flow through to your 1040. And so it's really hard to do business planning if you don't understand your 1040, because we call it flow through taxation. Um, Unless you're going straight up S Corp, um, not S Corp, C Corp, a lot of what you do in your business is still going to impact your personal finances if you don't understand those forms. Um, I said a lot. Okay, I have 15 minutes left. So I am going to, um, here's my information. I'm going to pause it here for a second so you can write it down. That's my email. That's my um, business line. Um, sign up for tax class if you want more information um, or follow me on social media. And I am done. Do you have questions for me, John, Asia? Oh, you know, we got some questions. Oh, I got a question for you. <laughs> okay, okay. Go ahead, Asia. So, you know, I mean, we all got those stimulus checks and stuff. How mm -hmm. many people hit our taxes? <clears throat> Say that again? Sorry. You know, we got depending on how many people you had in your house, you got a stimulus check. Mm -hmm. What about it? Oh, sorry. Is that something I'm going to have to claim? Am I have to report that? No, no. So technically, according to like what the CARES Act said, first of all, let me say this. As a lawyer, I'm always apprehensive to tell people what they're going to have to do when new law rolls out. And the reason why is because let's just step back. These people just passed a law overnight, right? Like they really did. They was fighting about it and they just passed it. So when they passed it, half of them didn't even know what the law meant because let's be clear, all legislators are not lawyers. And then two, um, there's the idea that, you know, like how we were first told, oh, so many people would be able to get unemployment. And then as time progressed, that pipeline got narrow and narrower, narrower because what they do is they pass these general laws and they send them to committees and the committees have to figure out how are we going to implement them? What are the restrictions? So forth and so on. And so as things roll out, more new laws come out that justify how those laws are going to roll out. And so I say that to say um, with the care with the stimulus checks, those were actually issued 
what the law says, and I'm summarizing, is that those were issued to us as credits. And so what they kind of did is they, I'm trying to figure out how to explain it. They kind of retroactively said, all of America, unless you owe child support, because that was like the exception for being able to keep your stimulus check, um, hmm. was that, you know, you get this credit. So you should have got this credit in 2019. We're giving it to you now in 2020. And if you look at our definition of what a credit is, um, it's something that dollar for dollar knocks down your tax bill. Um, what it also does is that if you don't have a tax bill, it um, you just get it back as a refund. And so some tax, some credits are considered refundable credits. And so the stimulus checks were issued to us as refundable credits. So not income, but credits. The, the, the assumption is you paid all your taxes and here's your credit. Does that make sense? Okay, I did. So I think I'm good. Yeah, no, we're good. We, we got our checks. We shouldn't be worried about that. Now, you know, I mean, the conspiracy theorist and me is always like, these people always change and stuff. This stuff is so new. I don't trust nothing. I like, you know, it's like the vaccines. I ain't trusting it till I see it roll out for a good five years. That's just me. I'm not anti-vaccination. I'm not pro-vaccination. I'm just saying I don't trust nothing. I, I let time tell. But ideally, those are supposed to be credits. We're not supposed to be worried about them. Okay. Just want to just, just want to check. But yeah, yeah. Tax time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that I think you broke down a lot of good points because um, I know people always struggle with um, on the ten forty form or the W four form filling out. You know, sometimes people for financial reasons go exempt. How does that impact them tax wise? You know, when they, if you don't fill out that form right or if you don't get the right numbers of. Uh, dependents and things of that nature, how does it affect the, the taxes? Okay, so see that's, if I got your question right, you're talking about like how some people have exemptions and what's the issue if you don't get those numbers right? Okay, this is a layered question. So there's a couple of things. Um, there's the exemptions you claim on when you start a job, right? Um, or you do contract work and they're withholding money to cover your taxes. You have to, um, you file a W-4, um, what's it when you have a 1099? It's something similar, whatever. You have to file these forms to let them know how much tax withholdings, right? And those forms have completely changed. So whatever your withholdings were in like whatever number, let's say back in 2014, you might've said, you know, I'm entitled to four exemptions. That's going to be totally different now because of the new W-4s that got rolled out with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So that's very case by case. Um, my rule of thumb, and this is just me, and some people would say, you know, it's funny because it reminds me when I was um, taking my, when I started my tax program, you know, I, I had a professor, he was like, okay, so, you know, if you could pay your, your rent every um, month, would you rather pay it every month or in one lump sum at the end of the year? And I was like, every month? And he was like, why? And I was like, because I want to make sure I'm not homeless. He's like, so you wouldn't just want to pay it at the end of the year? And I was like, no. And he was like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, you don't make any sense. Have you ever been homeless? And in his mind, he was like, no, you want to keep your money so you can invest it. If you're paying your rent every month, then what's happening is you're giving your money, you're not investing it. The idea is to keep your money, flip it, and then pay you know, make more money and then pay your rent at the end of the year. And I was like, see, those are two different philosophies. And the reason why I break that down is because that's how tax withholdings work um, and exemptions. Like how many exemptions you're going to claim are really going to be dependent on your personality. I'm one of those people where I claim zero and one because I like to claim pay my rent every month. Right. But some people are like, no, I want more of my money up front. So I'm going to claim as many exemptions as I can. So if they tell me I get an exemption for each child, I get an exemption for myself, I get an exemption for owning property. They're taking all their exemptions. They're putting on their W-4 so they can get more of their money up front. And then they're like, and if I owe you at the end of the year, I owe you. And I understand that, but I'm also kind of like, once again, that only makes sense if you're somebody who's into investing. If you're not really doing something with that money to flip it, I think you just need to pay your bills on time. But that's just me. And so um, that, that, that's one point on exemptions. The other one is that before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you would also see exemptions on your tax returns. And so before we used to get like about $4,000 um, in exemptions per child that you had. 
the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act got away with that, kind of suspended that definition of exemption, and they just increased the standard deduction. And so, for example, um, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, as a single person with no kids, I had about a $6,000 standard deduction and a $4,000 exemption, which gave me a total of $10,000 off of my taxable income. What they did is they said, we're not doing that. As if you're a single person with no kids, we're just giving you a $12,000 deduction. We're getting rid of the exemptions. And so although I have a higher, so now I get $12,000 off of my gross income, I get a $12,000 deduction as opposed to the 10 that I was getting before. Um, that works good for me. That's not working well for a lot of people because like if you're head of household and you were getting $4,000 per child, now you're just capped at 18. And so when we talk about exemptions, depending on how many people you claim, some people are worse off, some people are better off. Does that answer your question? Definitely answer my question, but here both sides of the conversation, we are trying to be intentional with educating our, our people about finance and we wanna change the paradigm in our thinking and, and we should be investing. And I want people to understand when you when you don't or you claim uh, zero or single, you know, you're giving the government opportunity to take your money and invest it and make a profit off of it. Uh, because you got to realize if they getting that money off everybody who claims single zero, they're invested making money off you. So why not keep your money invested? Find other ways. That's why you want to get with a tax attorney like uh, Natasha or you know, an accountant to really figure out your strategy. I like what you said early, like get a strategy because I'm all about trying to figure out the die, uh, uh, the, the, the Trump loopholes where I don't have to pay all the taxes. So right. uh, the key there is having a strategy. Let's be honest. A lot of us ain't got no strategy. So if you just doing stuff to save, but you don't have no strategy, you might end up harming yourself in the long run. Like I have, I ain't gonna lie. I got a whole lot of clients who had the intention of being strategic they never followed through. And so what ends up happening is that they end up owing a tax bill. And when it's time to pay it, they don't have no money to pay it. And so then they're stuck with the debt with the IRS that's growing interest and penalties. And so um, I'm here you like I'm trying to push people to do better too. But I'm also really big on knowing yourself. Know thyself. If you're not going to follow through, don't do it. Now that that that's true. You definitely have to be intentional. Um, but you know, here we're trying to definitely promote people to invest, do their retirements, and uh, definitely like use their Roths and different things to help leverage your your, your income. Which are deductions, so yeah. you should be doing it right. Definitely, yeah. it, and it's just being aware. And like you said, I like how you said strategy and all of this with financial wealth building and and literacy. It's all strategy having a budget, understanding the numbers. And if you don't understand the numbers and understand how it works, definitely want to have somebody like you on the team that can make it happen. So uh, great information. Thank you. Yeah. And do you understand the tax man will come after you? Like you can't dip and dodge. You can't hide from, because I had that happen where I had my deductions. They, um, I was single, but they, for some reason, my job did me as married. So they took less taxes out. And then when it came back around, oh yeah, they did that. And then they wound up garnishing my wages to pay the tax bill because I didn't realize, or I didn't talk to them to try to settle it appropriately. And I think that's, you know, one of the classes you're going to teach that I didn't do it appropriately. And all of a sudden that, that thing came and hit at Christmas time. Like, oh, we take it three, four dollars a month. And I'm like, Oh, no, 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 mm -mm. no, 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 no. And, and that's one thing I love to highlight to people. I'm like, the IRS is not that scary. Talk to them. Like, there's, I, I don't know what it is. It's like, we look at the IRS like the Russian mafia. I'm half Russian. I could say that, right? <laughs> like, um, no, but real talk. It's like, they not. Like, they actually, the California Franchise Tax Board's a little rough. But the IRS is not that bad. Like, you can actually... They have so many avenues to get into compliance. It's actually ridiculous. Like, I'm not going to lie. I was like, to me, tax court is the most functional court in this country. I've done criminal law. I've done all that. I'm like, tax court is functional. And um, because there's just so many ways to appeal. There's so many ways to talk to people. I'll be honest, as a regular citizen, it's really hard to get them on the line. But if you get connected with a tax professional and file that power of attorney, like I can call them, I can figure out what the liability is, I can figure out how to get you in compliance, you know, 
sometimes often most of the clients I work with, we end up putting in a currently non-collectible phase. So you can keep your Christmas money. You know what I mean? And pay in payments or th there's so many, um, other options besides just being scared that like once I started getting the taxes, I'm like, no, talk to the IRS. If there's one thing I could tell people, do not ignore the letters, call a professional, get your stuff situated, because what hurts even more is to see clients accrue penalties mm -hmm. and interest. Like to have a bill that really started out as $2,000 become a $10,000 bill because you ignored it. That hurts. Wow, that's deep. That's deep. That's good information, y'all. Y'all see what we're doing here. We intentionally putting the right people in place to give you the game and the information to maintain out here because we understand if you don't have that information, whoo, it can get rough out in these streets. And it's cold out here in wintertime right now. It's cold. So we don't want you out in these streets. But um, I'm looking in our group. I don't see any comments in the group. Um, and I see people in the, in, in the Zoom, but I don't see any uh, questions for you. Um, so if you have anything else you want to give the people, you can. I think you covered a lot of information. We'll definitely replay uh, this video again in our group. We'll do another watch party. As some people on the East Coast time and sleep, they might find information helpful. We'll get it on our YouTube. We'll get it on our website and uh, hook you up. So make sure people reach out to you. But um, could you also just verbalize your information one more time, how to contact you. So if somebody don't have a pen or if they watching or they driving, they can hear you verbalize it and they can write it down to reach out to you. Yeah. So um, my website is venscolaw.com, V-E-N-T-S-K-O-Law.com. You can also find me on Instagram at Tasha Talk. Um, Tasha Tax, I think it's Tasha underscore tax, and on Facebook at Tasha Talks Tax, or just go look for my um, Facebook page, Natalia, um, Natalia A. Vinsco, something. I, Y'all, I don't, I don't know my own information. Just put my name in Natalia Vinsco, Law Office of Natalia Vinsco, that's what it is, um, or Tasha Talks Tax. Um, you put that, um, what they call those? Lord, my brain. Y'all, it's, it's not working. Um, hashtag. That's what it's called. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag Tasha Talks Tax. Um, you'll be able to find me. All right, all right. Thank you, uh, Natasha, for coming on, and um, you know, thank you for supporting us. And I'll reach out to you afterwards for some other stuff that we want to do with you. Um, you know, just thank you for coming on and giving this information to our community. Um, that's what we're trying to do here on our educational Thursdays: is be intentional to make sure community has information, and just trying to you know continue to grow that. And I think education and literacy is very important. And that's what we're pushing here, um, trying to break that 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 lie that people in the community don't care and and people not trying to help out. We want to see everybody win, especially on the financial level, because the only way we can make change to stop what's happening in America that we see is being financially and economically powerful to make change and make decisions and get the right people in place to help us. Um, but we definitely have to unite and um, be thoughtful and understand that process. So uh, thank you for coming on. So for everybody out there, this is our Educational Thursday presentation night. This was a, a very powerful and informative uh, uh, presentation tonight. We wanna thank our guests for coming on. We're getting ready for an amazing conversation this Sunday, very powerful, very touchful conversation. This Sunday, we'll be talking about human trafficking. Um, community will be understanding it you know, how this work. We got some professionals that's going to come on that's in that industry that's going to talk to us to educate community about um, this human trafficking that's going on in our country, not just here in the Bay Area, but in our country. Um, we understand that this is a big billion dollar business. Um, a lot of our young ladies are being snatched off the streets in human traffic. And um, as community, we need to understand and be aware of what's going on, how to identify uh, when these type of situations come come uh, up and how do we uh, support these young ladies and not uh, stigmatize them, make them feel comfortable and safe. So I think it'll be a great conversation. And with that being said, if you are a, a additional panelist or someone who has that type of information or background and you would like to join that discussion this Sunday, please go to our website at www bothsidesoftheconversation.org and there's some links on there that you can uh, sign up to be a panelist or if you know someone who might be in that profession whether it's law enforcement or as a community organization that deal with people who are human traffic um, and you think they should be a part of this conversation please check out our website and refer those people you can sign them up give us our give them their uh, information and we'll reach out to them um, the more people the better different perspective um, but we got to keep these conversations going um, so hopefully um, you know we get through it 
It's going to be a tough conversation. It's very emotional and traumatized for some people. And uh, I think it'll be a powerful conversation for community. And then the following Tuesday, we'll continue our Hidden Gym segment. Uh, you know what that Hidden Gym segment is about. Highlight people like Natasha that's doing amazing things in our community. Um, and we also highlight our Black and Brown businesses, trying to get our business people um, out here. We have a platform here. We have followers. We have people who are watching. This is an opportunity for you to promote your business. You could go to our website. You can nominate a business. You can nominate a hidden gym. You can fill out the person information and we'll reach out to them and get them on. So we're trying to open this thing up. We know we got a lot of feedback from community. A lot of people said they didn't want to nominate anybody because they thought it was a San Francisco thing. We are trying to connect the Bay Area and, and beyond. So um, just go to the website, check it out. Uh, definitely um, all the information is there. And then we'll have another uh, educational Thursday presentation um, next week. And then also next Friday, uh, January the 16th, we will have our official website launch party. Come join us, come hang out. All of the both sides of the uh, conversation team will be here. We'll be introducing ourselves so everybody can see who's in the background doing things, making this happen, because we can't make this happen without Asia, Kashla, Jada, and the different people, Tashel, and uh, all these people, Danielle. We have all these people that's doing amazing things behind the scene that you guys don't see. I know you guys always see me and Rico, but it's a lot of things um, turning in this machine on behind. So we'll come on and uh, we'll do a live webinar and we'll present the uh, website officially to everybody. And uh, we'll take you guys through a step-by-step -step how to navigate the site. We try to make it very, very uh, simple and very user-friendly. Um, and we definitely open for feedback. That's why we had the pre-party so people could start going on there telling us what, what they think. It's easier ways to nominate somebody, book appointments, uh, book some airtime, whatever it is you're trying to do. We try to make the site uh, very simple to use and navigate. So looking forward to that. And, um, you know, with that being said, that's it. You know, this is the end of the show. We'll see you guys on Sunday. Have a great evening. Be safe out there. Be aware. Uh, we have some tough times in our country, especially in this transition period. Uh, just be safe because there's there's some people out here that is not happy. And um, we know when people are not happy, um, things can go left. So be safe out there, people. We see you guys on our next segment this Sunday on our Sunday conversation. See y'all later. Have a nice evening.